This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Leningrad, until the communist revolution, the capital of Russia. A city of history and beauty. Leningraders are proud of it and of its title, the Hero City. That title was won for what it suffered in the Second World War. But Leningraders didn't think of themselves as heroes. Suffering that now seems beyond human endurance was then a daily routine. Midday, June the 22nd, 1941. Foreign Minister Molotov broadcast to the nation. Leningrad learned that Hitler had launched a surprise dawn attack and that Russia was at war with its former ally, Nazi Germany. Within hours, German troops had advanced deep into Russia. Most of the Red Air Force had been destroyed on the ground. Hitler boasted that his Operation Barbarossa would make the world hold its breath. His soldiers would give final proof of the superiority of Nazism by overthrowing communism within six months. His army's plan to capture Stalingrad, Moscow and Leningrad. Leningrad was a great seaport and industrial centre, but above all, it was the birthplace of Russian communism. Leningraders reacted with instinctive patriotism. For them, it wasn't a struggle between ideologies, it was an attack on their country and their city. Men marched away to protect homes and families, but also to do something more, to defend Leningrad, the city which no one had captured since its foundation by Peter the Great. As St. Petersburg, it had been Russia's capital for over 200 years, its window to European civilization. Renamed Leningrad after the revolution, it wasn't only the city of czars and palaces, of Lenin and communism, but the center of Russian poetry, music, ballet and literature. Every Leningrader, communist and non-communist alike, shared the same fierce local pride, a pride so deep it was almost a faith. In only 16 days, the German tanks advanced 300 miles. Stalin was said to have been incapacitated by shock, unable to make decisions. One million people rushed out of Leningrad to build tank traps and fortifications. Today, we have dug defenses for 16 hours. It is bitterly cold and I have only thin dresses. We stand to our ankles in water, and my feet bleed terribly. I am afraid I shall never dance again. We've worked for 18 days without a break, 12 hours a day, and I'm 57. The soil is so hard, we have to use a pick. The dry clay is as hard as rock. It was no use. The German armies swept over the trenches and their defenders. During August 1941, their tanks came to within 20 miles of the city, while to the north, Russia's old enemy Finland had started to close in as well. Leningrad now prepared for the defense of the city itself. And, uh, for instance, every corner of our streets was turned into a, how to say, the defensive um, point 
all the windows uh, were bricked. And, uh, you know, people were ready to meet Germans in the streets of Leningrad. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. 300,000 civilians joined a militia to fight for the city street by street. Workers marched to their factories armed, ready for when the moment came. There was martial law, a curfew from 10 at night until 5 in the morning, restrictions on movement, spot checks on passers, severe penalties for rumour mongers and defeatists. The city became full of suspicion. Tram conductors even gave up calling out the names of stops for fear of giving information to spies. Private radios and telephones were banned. Fighting was now going on in the southern suburbs. The resistance of the Russians surprised the Germans who'd thought the people would want to be freed from the communist dictatorship. But the advance continued. On September the 8th, 1941, the Germans reached the shores of Lake Ladiga. Leningrad was surrounded, cut off from the rest of Russia. To the north, the Finnish army securely dug in among the forests and wastes stretching away into the Arctic. The possibility of help from the north completely cut off. To the west, the sea blocked by German and Finnish shore batteries and U-boats. The Red Fleet was trapped in its Leningrad base. The sea route in and out of the city was closed. To the south and east, the German army still pressed in on the city. Already they had cut the railway connecting Leningrad with Moscow and the rest of Russia. Finally, in the northwest, the waters of Lake Ladiga as wide as the English Channel and surrounded by uninhabited forest and swamp. Leningrad was encircled. Like all modern cities, it couldn't support itself. Life depended on supplies from outside. Three million people were trapped in a stranglehold, cut off without even emergency stockpiles of food or fuel. The world waited for Leningrad to fall. The Germans looked down on the city, only seven miles from the centre now. Hitler had invitations printed for the celebration banquet to be held in the main hotel. But the Russians were going to make Hitler fight for the city. For Stalin, the country seemed to face defeat, but Leningrad would be defended no matter what the cost in lives. The city waited for the attack to begin. Leningrad knew what to expect, the familiar pattern which Hitler had used to crush city after city across Europe. Huge air raids to weaken the defences and terror bombing to demoralise the population, followed at the right psychological moment by the crushing advance of the tanks.
the air raids were almost continuous. Leningraders had read how London survived. We watched them like pupils waiting for an examination. But London had not been surrounded by Nazi tanks and artillery. But the bombing did not produce the panic that it had in other cities, nor the readiness to accept defeat. Between attacks, the city's public address system broadcast patriotic songs, relayed into every street, home and workshop by thousands of loudspeakers, the defiant music echoed the determination of the people. Crowded together in air raid shelters, helping in rescue work, they drew strength and hope from each other and from any small victories that came their way. Crowds formed round the first German plane shot down over the city. Under the common danger, people drew closer together. The three million surrounded Leningraders became like one huge family. The Germans bombed round the clock, and in the factories, people worked round the clock to keep the city's defences supplied with arms. They were glad to work the long hours. They felt they were hitting back. But the situation was getting desperate. Damaged factories were running out of raw materials and often there was no electricity because power stations had been hit. October 1941, the first snow. Leningrad still held out, but Hitler had decided to change his tactics. Many of the attacking troops were withdrawn to strengthen the drive on Moscow. Those that remained dug in and waited for Leningrad to collapse. Hitler was convinced that it was only a matter of time before the city fell. Cut off from supplies, the people would surrender. They could not continue to resist once they began to starve. Stalin ordered Dmitry Pavlov to take charge of Leningrad's food supplies. My first priority was to check on our resources. When we checked, we found the provisions for the army and civilians were only enough for 30 days. The winter of 1941 grew colder, the worst for over a hundred years. It wasn't just a question of staying alive, but of staying strong enough to resist the Germans. The last reserves of food and fuel drained away. Rations were reduced again and again. Some way had to be found to supply the city or it would die. The only way was by air, slow twin-engine planes weaving low over the enemy lines. But with Russia on the verge of military disaster, only 60 planes could be spared, and they could bring in only 45 tons a day. The minimum needed to stay alive was 2,000 tons a day. 60 planes couldn't feed and supply 3 million people. By November, people were eating their pets, dogs and cats. Children were scraping under the snow for leaves or scavenging for animal foods. Zhadanov, secretary of the Leningrad party committee, had to find a solution. The only possible supply route was across Lake Ladiga. The distance was 18 miles. Because of the severe cold, it had frozen. On November the 18th, 
a man was sent out on horseback to see if he could get to the other side. He succeeded. A gap had been found in the circle. Zhadanov ordered a road to be built. 18 miles across the ice would be difficult enough, but the total distance from Leningrad and over uncharted wastes on the other side to the nearest railway line was 237 miles. That was further than from London to Paris. It seemed impossible, but it had to be tried. The surface of the ice was uneven, deep crevices and ice whipped into ridges by violent storms. A labor force of thousands was given 15 days to build the road. The hungry men were paid in food, not money. Just five days later, the first trucks were crossing, only carrying half loads because of the danger of sinking through the thin ice. But the link was there. They called it the road of life. On the first day, the lorries brought in 33 tons. To survive at all, the Leningraders needed 100 times that. There was less than a week's supply of flour left. Food shops were closed and bread was distributed from stores in each district or at work. The rations were reduced to 10 small pieces of bread for workers and five for others. Everyone went hungry. First days, it just hurts, like something um, cuts you. And then it also very, um, how to say, uh, dull, dull pain, you see, continuous pain. The ration was three times below starvation level. In laboratories, scientists fought to find ways of making food go further. They discovered substitutes and invented new foods. The flour lasted longer because bread was made of 10% oil cake, 10% cellulose, 20% dust beaten from old flour sacks, 2% wallpaper paste, and the rest corn and rye meal. Milk was made from soya beans. Soup was made from sheep gut found in the dock and even processed industrial grease or bark from trees. One day I was walking down the street. It was snow covered, nothing unusual. But on my way back I saw a corpse sitting there, frozen. I was horribly frightened. There was electricity for only an hour or two each day. It was needed for the factories. Then the tram stopped. Starving people had to walk everywhere, even for their rations. And it was 30 degrees below freezing. Outside the city, the Germans too froze. They'd expected to take Leningrad in the autumn, and so weren't prepared for the Russian winter. To speed up the city's surrender, they moved guns onto the hills and shelled it. Finding the strength to stay alive was not enough. People had to find the energy to work. In battered factories, shortages of power and materials had to be overcome. The front line had to be supplied with arms and ammunition if the Germans were to be kept at bay. Our factory, the Kirov, was hit by 5,000 shells. A thousand people died. The ambulance brigade picked up the dead and wounded, spread sand on the floor, and the rest of us carried on with the job. Our hours were reduced from 10 to 8, and beds were provided in shelters to preserve our energy. Workers who were ill at home were brought to the factory dispensary by sledge. We had all our windows blown out by a bomb. And I thought to myself, now we really can't go on. Not till spring. We can't go on almost without food. And yet somehow we didn't stop. 
And sure enough, within six hours, we were working again. Working in hellish conditions, with eight degrees of frost in the workshop, 14 degrees in the office. One of our foremen was so weak, we all were, one way or the other. But this foreman couldn't supervise the repair of tanks. He had to be lashed to his bench to supervise the repair work. Apart from the food shortage and no fuel, there was a severe frost. We burnt furniture, books and wooden houses. But all of it was used up very quickly. For a city like Leningrad, you need 120 trainloads of fuel per day. And we only had enough to supply bread factories, ordnance factories, hospitals and so on. It meant that the city wasn't heated at all. And people were freezing to death. By the end of November 1941, the hunger was so intense that people tried to eat leather and boiled glue to spread on scraps of bread. In one month, 11,000 Leningraders starved and froze to death. Some hid the corpses of relatives to keep their ration books. A few went mad and turned cannibal. The number of deaths was going up each day. December 1941. Even the soldiers defending Leningrad were starving. If something wasn't done soon, the city was lost. All available men and materials were moved up to try to break through the circle in a simultaneous attack from inside and outside. The city waited for news. The forces inside Leningrad made no progress, but the Russian army attacking from outside made a push towards the city. It didn't break through, but the advance was enough to build a new railway up to Lake Ladiga. The length of the road of life was hard. On the lake, the drivers were pressed to do two trips a day, then three, then four. The trucks were used not only to bring food in, but to take the starving out. But many refused the chance to escape. They felt leaving was desertion. Thousands of those who set out never reached the other side. Already weak, the journey, in temperatures of 40 degrees below zero, was too much for them. Yet despite that, and repeated German bombing, tens of thousands reached safety. One thousand trucks were smashed or lost. Many drivers were drowned when they fell through the ice. Some fell asleep at the wheel from hunger and exhaustion, but the supplies getting in crept steadily up. On December the 25th, 1941, a first small increase was made in the ration, a gamble with no reserve to back it up. It still wasn't enough to live on, but the effect on morale was enormous. At the front, there was stalemate. The Russians waited, hoping to become strong enough to attack. The Germans waited, hoping for Leningrad to collapse from cold and hunger. Only the Leningraders could decide the outcome, not the opposing armies. Rations had been increased, but they were still below starvation level. The cold was more intense than ever. 
The number of deaths went up and up from 11,000 in November 1941 to 50,000 in December to 100,000 in January 1942. Almost the only thing that hadn't stopped was the public address system. For starving people, alone in cold, dark rooms, it was often the only contact with life, pouring out music, poetry, instructions, news. It echoed round the frozen streets. It never stopped. January 1942, no one expected to survive. When parting, friends wished each other a final farewell. There were now so many corpses in the streets that people no longer took any notice of them. Yet there was no looting, no riots, no talk of surrender. If the broadcasters ran out of music or became too weak and hungry to perform, then the loudspeakers played the sound of a metronome. Anything rather than silence. Silence meant death. I remember our children. You see, they looked like old men. And if they would see a bright toy or a small piece of bread, they would prefer to take a piece of bread. It was heartbreaking to see the children waiting and watching for food being cooked. Especially it was difficult to see my eldest son, who was nearly three at the time. I got so weak, I couldn't move. They took me to bed. They wanted to undress me, but they had to cut my boots off. You would get up in the mornings and see crowds of people in the streets coming from or to work and dying in their tracks and freezing solid. The corpses would be collected in lorries and taken to the cemetery. We weren't strong enough to actually dig the earth, so we would use explosives to make large pits and put the corpses in this collective grave. And then the metronome stopped. The city held its breath. After three hours, the ticking started again. Rescuers found a small girl alone in a room. She was called Tanya Savage. She was so weak that they couldn't save her. Close by was her diary. Senya died on the 28th of December, 12.30 in the morning.
grandmother died on the 25th of January at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Lara died 17th of March at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uncle Leisha, 10th of May at 4 o'clock. Uncle Vaja died 13th of April, 2 o'clock at night. Tanya is left alone. By February 1942, the death rate was still rising, as many as 10,000 a day. But life didn't stop. Composers still wrote music, professors still researched in the libraries. The writers even held a conference. They were so cold they had to burn the chairs they sat on, but they held their conference. Those who kept working, continued their interests, seemed to survive longer than those who stayed at home in bed to keep warm and preserve their strength. The order of dying was first the very old and the very young, then the men, and lastly, the women. The city's musical comedy theatre remained open, even though the artists often collapsed from hunger when they left the stage. Before you went onto the stage, you were just an ordinary person, exhausted and hungry from lack of food and sleep. But when you saw the audience waiting for something from you, you felt transformed and danced and sang just as joyfully and gaily as we had before the war. It was as necessary for the audience as bread. At last, in March 1942, came the first signs of warmer weather. But the spring also brought dangers. The ice on the lake was melting. The road of life would be cut. The trucks crossed faster until the last safe moment. And now there was the threat of epidemics. Dead bodies revealed under the melting snow. Uncleared refuse. Polluted water from cracked pipes and mains. A big cleansing campaign was organized to prevent outbreaks of disease in an already weakened population. It was like trying to clean up the North Pole covered with garbage. There were housewives and school children and educated people, professors, doctors, musicians, old men and women. One turned out with a crowbar, another with a child's sledge. April the 15th, 1942, 3,000 people died, but a tram ran in the city. People who saw it wept with joy. It was the first tram for four months.
That tram was the first real sign that the city could come back to life. It meant power in the cables, fresh strength in people's hearts. They started to repair the houses and build new supply routes. They turned the ice road into the water road. In May 1942, the boats were bringing in more supplies than ever before. Food rations had been increased, yet thousands were still dying from the effect of the winter's starvation. It was decided that everyone strong enough to travel would be evacuated. If possible, only soldiers and workers would be left in the city. Fresh troops were brought in to strengthen the weary garrison. At the front, the military stalemate continued. Although the Russian build-up went on, the decision to attack was still not made. As the siege continued, a campaign was organized to restore the physical fitness of the million people who now remained in the city. They needed not only food, but exercise to revive withered muscles. Football commentaries were even broadcast to the German lines to taunt them on their failure to take the city. Outside Leningrad, there were many wooden houses, and those houses were dissembled and shared between the ingredients. But not a single tree in our parks and in our gardens was cut down. It was like a kill a, um, you know, human being. But they did cut as much wood as they could from the forests immediately outside the city. 3,000 women were organized to lay in timber for the coming winter. They wanted no repetition of 1941. There was also peat in the marshes near the city, which hadn't been thought worth using before the war. Although within range of German guns, it was dug and stored. Vegetables were grown in every available plot of land. Each family was issued with a siege gardening handbook. Vitamin deficiency had been one of the worst effects of the food shortage. To counteract scurvy, Leningraders had to take a drink made by pouring hot water on pine needles. The city was becoming steadily stronger, even if shrapnel had to be removed from cabbage before it could be eaten. By the autumn of 1942, nearly everyone left in the city had been organized and trained to play an active part in its defense. Their physical strength had been built up, their morale was higher than ever before. Leningrad waited for the winter. It was now a fortress, the fortress it should have been a year before. On January the 12th, 1943, the Russians were at last ready for the long-awaited attack to break the siege. As the troops waited to move forward, news came of the decisive Russian victory at Stalingrad. It seemed a good omen. Again, the plan was to attack simultaneously from inside and outside. Only six days later, on January the 18th, 1943, the people heard 
that the first part of the plan had been successful. The two Russian armies had met. Immediately, a railway line linking the city with Moscow and the rest of Russia was built through the six-mile-wide corridor that had been opened. The second part of the plan was for the two armies to swing south and drive the enemy from Leningrad, but the German resistance was stiff. The first train passed through the corridor with bitter fighting still going on only a few miles away. Cheering crowds welcomed its arrival certain that their long struggle was over, but it wasn't. By the spring of 1943, the German heavy guns still overlooked Leningrad. They launched a heavier bombardment than ever before. Dividing the city into squares, they shelled each area methodically. A fifth of the city's housing was destroyed. Peak shelling times were the morning and evening rush hours when most people were exposed out of doors. People became bitter. After all they'd been through, it was hard to find reserves of strength. The suffering should have been over, and now it wasn't. During the summer of 1943, the songs on the loudspeakers still spoke of the people's love for the city. The Leningraders were tired, but any bitterness came second to their hatred of the Germans. The notices read, this side of the street during shelling. Because the Germans were shelling from the south, the south sides of streets protected by the high walls of buildings were always safest. Only the few thousand school children were hurried to shelter during alerts. Others were so used to bombardment by now that they carried on as normal, risking the shell bursts and shrapnel. By the end of 1943, 16,000 people had been killed by the shelling and 33,000 injured. Leningrad was waiting for the day when it would hit back. Although only half the city's workers were left and only one third of the machines, the output of munitions actually increased. I would like to say a few words. Receiving this medal, I remember my father, who has worked here for 20 years. He taught a lot of workers here, and me as well. His life was abruptly brought to an end by the enemy bombs. For the death of my father, and for the destruction of Leningrad, I swear to take my vengeance on the Germans by giving all my energy to the home front, and if necessary, I will fight. On January the 14th, 1944, the long-awaited Russian attack began.
after two weeks of fierce fighting, the siege was broken. The German retreat was to end only in Berlin. Prisoners shuffled through the city into captivity, the only German soldiers the people had seen. On the 27th of January, 1944, Leningrad was at last able to celebrate its release. The siege had lasted 900 days. People uh, never met each other, they kissed each other and cried. It, it meant for us that we were born <laughs> again for the second time. The argument still continues over how many people died in Leningrad. The official figure was 632,000, but this may have been minimized to excuse the delay in liberating the city. Stalin had no great love for Leningrad. Later estimates put the toll at at least one million, ten times that of Hiroshima, certainly more than any other city in history. After the war, Leningrad was proclaimed a hero city of the Soviet Union. The word hero may seem inappropriate or inadequate, but it's hard to find a better. And one more peculiar uh, thing about the ingredients. They never cried. And as poet as Olga Bergoltz said, that tears frozen out on the faces of Leningradians. They never cried uh, uh, when they found their dwellings destroyed, when they buried their dear relatives, children and parents. Первые лучи стоп причин, почему мы сер... 